Israel just took out Hezbollah leader Nasrallah. In a dramatic turn of events Israel has reportedly targeted and eliminated Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah, a significant figure in Middle Eastern politics. This breaking news has sent shockwaves across the region and the world, raising questions about the future of Israeli-Hezbollah relations and the implications for regional stability. In this video we delve into the details of the operation, the motives behind Israel's actions, and the potential consequences for Lebanon and the broader Middle East. Join us as we analyze expert opinions, reactions from world leaders, and what this means for the ongoing conflict. Stay updated on the latest developments in this evolving story. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more breaking news on global affairs. In September 2024, Hassan Nasrallah, leader of Hezbollah, was killed in an Israeli airstrike in Beirut, Lebanon. The operation, carefully planned by Israeli intelligence, aimed to weaken the group's leadership after years of indirect conflict between Israel and Hezbollah. Nasrallah, considered one of the most powerful and dangerous figures in the Middle Eastern geopolitical scene, had been Hezbollah's secretary general since 1992. Under his leadership, the group evolved from a local Shia militia in Lebanon into a military and political force with global influence. Additionally, he was seen as the chief architect of Hezbollah's operations and its strategic alliances with Iran and other regional groups. Nasrallah was hiding in a high-security underground bunker located at Hezbollah's headquarters in Beirut. This bunker, 25 meters deep, was designed to withstand direct attacks from missiles and high-power bombs. It was part of a sophisticated underground network equipped with secure communication systems and defenses against airstrikes. Built with reinforced concrete and protective layers, the bunker's purpose was to ensure that Hezbollah's top leaders could continue to operate even under heavy attack. However, after the strike that killed Hassan Nasrallah, images and eyewitness accounts of the site revealed a large and deep crater, showing the power of the weapons Israel used to hit the underground bunker. This raises a key question, how was it possible to destroy a concrete bunker buried 25 meters underground? The most effective way to destroy a bunker at such depth is by using special missiles known as bunker busters. Missiles like the GBU-28, or the more modern GBU-72, are designed to penetrate deep into reinforced concrete or soil before exploding. They use a combination of explosive force, delayed fuses and precision guidance systems to drill through layers of earth and reinforced concrete. Once penetrated, the bomb explodes inside the structure, causing an internal collapse and destroying the bunker. These bombs were developed in the 1990s during the Gulf War to destroy deeply buried bunkers in Iraq. During Operation Desert Storm, the United States faced a significant challenge. Iraqi leaders, including Saddam Hussein, were taking refuge in concrete bunkers buried so deep that traditional weapons couldn't reach them. Faced with this problem, U.S. military engineers developed the GBU-28, a penetrative bomb capable of drilling through soil and concrete before exploding inside the bunkers. Using modified artillery tubes as the bomb's body, they managed to create a quick and effective solution. When the U.S. led a coalition against Iraq, an air campaign targeted Iraqi infrastructure, but the deeply buried bunkers, dug 9 to 15 meters deep, posed a problem. Existing penetration bombs like the Blue 109 could not pierce more than 1.8 meters of reinforced concrete. So, U.S. Air Force engineers, along with Lockheed missiles and space, began working on a solution. The greatest challenge was to produce a bomb casing that could break through deep layers of soil and concrete without being crushed. They used obsolete artillery tubes that had already proven capable of withstanding intense pressures during artillery fire. With the help of Texas Instruments, they also quickly developed a laser guidance system to ensure the bomb hit the target precisely. This guidance system paints the target with a laser, allowing the bomb or missile to home in on the exact impact point, maximizing its effectiveness. The combination of ingenuity, speed and technology enabled the creation of these bombs capable of destroying deeply buried bunkers, marking a milestone in modern military capabilities to counter underground threats. Once the operations of developing and finishing the bomb casings were completed, the team was ready for assembly. 
On the morning of Saturday, February 16, the first casings were loaded onto a C-130 cargo plane from the U.S. Air National Guard, with the paint still fresh. The second casing arrived a few hours later, and the third and fourth bombs began immediate production. When the bomb casing arrived at Eglin Air Force Base, it had to be filled with explosives. This casing, four meters long, was larger than any previously loaded at the base, so it didn't fit in the existing facilities, and the filling had to be done outdoors. To proceed, they dug a hole to place the bomb upside down and began filling it. The first casing was filled with concrete for the initial test, while the second was loaded with 286 kilograms of molten explosives compacted with wooden blocks. Stabilizers were then attached to the rear to improve aerodynamics, and the bombs were ready for testing. On February 24, 1991, the first bomb was mounted on an F-111 and launched in a dummy test over the Nevada desert. The bomb penetrated more than 30 meters into the ground at supersonic speed, and due to its depth, it was decided not to retrieve it due to high costs. Two days later, at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico, another test was conducted, firing the bomb at a 6.7 meter thick reinforced concrete slab. The penetrator was found over 800 meters away after piercing through the barrier, making it clear that the GBU-28 would meet its objective. The third and fourth casings were prepared in water fit, loaded with explosives at Eglin Air Force Base, and then flown to Saudi Arabia for deployment. On February 27, 1991, two F-111 fighter jets launched laser-guided bombs at a command and control bunker suspected of housing senior Iraqi military officers. The first plane missed, but the second hit the target precisely. Smoke rising from the bunker confirmed that the bomb had penetrated deeply, and photos showed a large hole in the roof confirming the success of the attack. With only one test launch, the GBU-28 holds the record for the fewest tests before operational deployment. One day after the attack on the Iraqi bunker, a hurried ceasefire was proposed, likely related to Saddam Hussein being informed that his last safe haven had been destroyed. Deep bunkers were no longer secure. Although Iraqi forces were already retreating from Kuwait, the GBU-28 attack was the final blow. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah didn't fully learn the lessons of the Gulf War regarding the vulnerability of underground bunkers. By continuing to use these shelters, he didn't recognize that they no longer offered the same protection as in the past. Similar to Saddam Hussein who was caught off guard by the destruction of his bunkers, Nasrallah paid a similar price. The Israeli attack revealed his failure to adapt his strategy to the realities of modern warfare. The attack was authorized by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, with support from Defense Minister Joab Gallant and IDF Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi. The operation, codenamed New Order, was carefully planned based on months of monitoring Nasrallah's whereabouts using surveillance technology such as drones, satellites, and intercepts. Once the bunker's exact location was identified, Israeli forces used precision missiles and deep penetration bombs launched by F-1 fighter jets. After the success of the strike was confirmed, Netanyahu cut short his visit to the U.S. and returned to Israel. Nasrallah's death is a devastating blow to Hezbollah which, under his leadership for over three decades, solidified itself as a powerful military force in Lebanon and a significant political player. His absence creates a leadership vacuum that could cause internal divisions and affect the group's strategy. Hezbollah had long been seen as untouchable due to its strategy of operating secretly and with high protection. After the assassination of his predecessor, Abbas al-Musawi, in 1992, Nasrallah had adopted an extremely cautious lifestyle, remaining hidden in underground bunkers in Beirut and other parts of Lebanon. However, this strategy was not enough to prevent his demise. If you enjoyed this video, don't miss our latest documentary on Civil War Divides Russia The Battle for Putin's Soul. Thanks for watching and don't forget to leave your own travel hacks in the comments below. If you're new here, consider subscribing for more travel tips, tricks and hacks. I'll see you in the next video.